next speaker is Lauren Oniras. She's an animal rights campaigner since the 80s and the founder of the Food Empowerment Project who has conducted, who has conducted investigations at uh, factory farms and slaughterhouses. Today in her presentation she will cover various abuses taking place in the food industry going beyond non-human animals to include farm workers, slavery, the global problem of access to healthy food in communities of colors and low-income communities. Where to turn this on at? Hi. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, hopefully, some of you heard Steve Best's talk, and I hope that I can help give you ideas on solutions that we can do to stop some of these problems. My talk is actually about human rights, animal rights. Um, the fact that we use this slogan a lot, we use the image of the fist in the paw, and how often do we really live up to this message? Um, that we try and say about ourselves. Um, as was stated, I've been an animal rights activist since the late 1980s, and I've worked on corporate campaigns, anti-vivisection, animals and entertainment, anti-fur, uh, animals raised and killed for food. I've been arrested, I've passed laws, I've stopped legislation, I've worked on the Shack campaign, I've done a lot of different areas and I think that they're all important, to be honest with you. I know there's a lot of talk about these issues here. And I just want to say really quickly that I think that all these issues have merit in terms of what you work on. And all these tactics that we can use are very important to do. What I'm going to be talking about today is more specifically about the ways that we can work on com combining human rights and animal rights together as one. So I started Food Empowerment Project um, after I spoke at the World Social Forum in Caracas, Venezuela where uh, I was running, a, if you've heard of the group Viva, um, based in England, I ran the USA chapter of that, and that's where I did my corporate campaigning and investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses. But when I was there, I was there to speak about all the different ways that our food impacts others. And I started to realize that all these issues that I cared about were all combined around food. So when I got involved in animal rights, I had already been an activist working on the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And I was working on the great boycott in, in the United States, which you may or may not have heard of, regarding farm workers. But what I realized was there's this need to work on all of these issues together as a way to create change. So that's basically, I mean, our whole thing, Food Empowerment Project's a vegan food justice organization. We promote veganism, but we also work on other social justice issues. And I want to thank the conference organizers for having this topic here. A lot of animal rights and vegan organizations um, don't see the need for us to bridge these issues together, to figure out ways that we can build our movement of fighting for justice. And as Steve outlined very well, um, one of the things that we all know about the issues uh, that impact animals is that capitalism is one of the main sources um, behind this. So as I stated, I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about um, the issues that we work on in a context from a US perspective. Because I don't want to make assumptions about any other country or how activism is done there. So, but there are issues that I'm talking about that are international issues and are things that we can all do to help make a difference, to help improve the lives of human and non-human animals. So as I stated, veganism is a core issue for Food Empowerment Project. It is something that every university, every talk that I give is part of what we do. We talk about ethical, the ethical reasons for being, for being vegan. Now, we don't deny that there are environmental benefits or health benefits for consuming a, a vegan diet. However, our organization is focused very specifically on the ethics. We are an ethics-based organization. One of the, the different ways that we talk about veganism in terms of a wider context is we have a, a food chain, is a newsletter we have coming out soon, for people who have just recently gone vegan who want, or who want to go vegan. And in every single issue, we talk about an animal, um, how they're raised and killed for food, a sanctuary, a rescue story about them, but also the human impact of animal consumption. So we talk about slavery in Brazil um, for, for beef consumption. Um, we talk about the environmental impacts. So these are the ways that we try and bridge in um, veganism to the other work that we do. We talk about, you know, our, our food chain newsletter does not only talk about veganism in terms of the animals, it talks about the human component. 
We also talk about environmental racism and how, how many people here are familiar with the term environmental racism? I don't know how familiar if it's kind of a US phenomena, which wouldn't surprise me. But basically what it means is that one portion of a population is more impacted by a negative a pollutant. So in terms of animals raised and killed for food, uh, and, and I should back up and say, majority of these places are where people of color live. And in the United States, people of color typically are um, African American and Latino populations. Um, you also have areas of environmental racism taking place in the Appalachia, which is a very white area, but these are very poor communities. So, but in context of animals, when we talk about environmental racism, we talk about the fact that majority of the factory farms are located in communities of color. So you have areas of North, in North Carolina, which is predominantly black, where people can't even open their windows because of the, the smell of the pig farms. Their property values have gone down. They are faced with nausea, and nosebleeds, and migraines. So we talk about this in context of, of how it's affecting the humans as well. Uh, I investigated pig farms in North Carolina where I showered like six times and still couldn't get the stench of the pig farms out of my hair and out of my skin. In California, we're the number one dairy producing state in the United States, where one dairy cow produces 120 pounds of wet manure per cow. And we have dairy farms as large as 28,000 cows. Living in these areas are predominantly Latinos, where you have people who don't necessarily speak English. They have the highest rates of asthma, which is caused by the dairy industry. So these are the issues that we talk about. When, when we talk about veganism, we talk about not only the impacts to animals, but we also talk about the impacts to human animals as well, as a way of getting people to understand the issue. One of the things that's happened in the United States is that the animal rights movement, in a sense, has tried to co-opt other issues. Um, instead, of, instead of really, truly, this is supposed to be black. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is my time to pontificate for a while. Um, basically, what we do is we try and make it seem as if everybody should care about veganism because uh, it affects everybody, which to an extent it does, but our food choices impact people too as vegans, which we're not so quick to point out. You will hear and see a lot of times in the United States activists referencing a quote of Martin Luther King Jr. about the arc the arc being bent towards justice. And they're talking simply about um, non-human animals. But they don't talk anything about the other forms of, of oppression that are taking place at the hands of the same systems that are oppressing non-human animals. Cesar Chavez, who many of you may or may not know, was a labor organizer in the United States. He's, he co-founded the United Farm Workers. He was a vegan. Um, I'm friends with some of his, his um, granddaughters. He was a vegan, but animal rights people, what they do is they go out and they leafleted events that are in honor of Cesar Chavez, even though farm worker rights are still a very, very real issue taking place in the United States. Instead of showing solidarity to an issue that we can all relate with, that we should all be fighting against, we end up co-opting that issue. And it's a, it's a grave concern of something that's happening. And when I'm talking about all these issues, I'm talking to those of you who, like me, who, who became a vegan and an animal rights activist because it was the sheer injustice that enraged us. It was the injustice in the pit of our stomach that we wanted to do something about, that we felt the need to fight. I get that same pit in my stomach when I learn about China and Foxconn, but you know what? It's not so much China who's causing the problems at Foxconn, it's Apple Computer based in the United States causing those problems. And if you want to look at the root of many of the problems around the world, and I will speak simply for the United States because that is where I am from, most of the majority of the problems are because of the United States and our, and our inability to mind our own business and our, 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 we have to meddle with everybody in the United States and we push our capitalistic system on everyone. And what happens is a human and non-human suffer alike. So one of the issue areas that we talk about with Food Empowerment Project is looking at the fact that if we talk about human rights, animal rights, and we sit there and we say things like, we eat the most compassionate diet and our diet is cruelty free, but we don't acknowledge the suffering inherent in the food that we eat, 
Anybody who works on human rights issues, anybody in the United States at least who can read a newspaper or watch TV knows that our food as well is drenched in slavery and oppression. And for us, that is our produce in the United States, which is picked by farm workers. Again, it's not just the food of vegans, it's everybody's food, so this is something that we talk about to everybody. Farm workers in the United States come from all over the world. You have some coming as far away as the Philippines, but the majority of our farm workers come from South and Central America, where we have farm workers who are living in horrific conditions. They live in labor camps, uh, crowded labor camps. They, these labor camps, um, the one that I've been to, is located near a dump in a correctional facility. Again, environmental racism there in terms of where they're located. A lot of them are homeless. These farms, these workers are not paid enough to put a roof over their heads. In fact, many of these farm workers don't even have access to the fresh produce that they're picking for the rest of the people around the country, not just California. Majority of the produce in many places of the world, but definitely throughout the United States, comes at the hands of farm workers. They are exposed to agricultural chemicals, the women face intense sexual abuse. Um, this is being documented more and more with these women face. So our food, even as vegans, is at the hands of people who well, are downright slaves to some extent. Um, there have been cases documented in Florida where workers who pick tomatoes are chained in, in 18-wheelers. You have over 400,000 of the farm workers in the United States are children, some as young as five years old, being found picking blueberries in Michigan. This is the food that we eat, too. I went ahead and I checked online to see what was happening in Europe. And you can tell, and I don't know how well it comes up, but it talks about the least developed countries being kind of one of the main places that food is going to be grown for Europe. In, the e in England, they talked about the, the salad growers um, in Spain being modern-day slaves. Unfortunately, again, this isn't as, as much as I like to talk about the United States in the most negative light possible. Um, it, isn't just a, it is not just the United States. Again, it's these Western capitalistic societies that are responsible for what's taking place. So here you have, again, and it, I, if you look in, into where your food is being grown, um, I tried to find everything for Europe, but unfortunately, me not being bilingual, again, i.e., I'm from the United States, so we aren't very hip on that. Um, I, I was only able to look up things in English. Chocolate. 70 to 75% of the world's cocoa comes from West Africa. In West Africa, you have approximately 1.8 million children in Ghana and the Ivory Coast who are victims of the worst forms of child labor, including slavery, all for the chocolate industry. It's worldwide, not the United States, it's everybody. This is the quote, hopefully everybody can see it, that got me thinking about this issue. It was from the BBC. They interviewed a former slave in the chocolate industry, and they asked him, what would you say to Westerners who eat chocolate? And he said, tell them when they are eating chocolate, they are eating my flesh. And as a vegan, as an animal rights activist, I thought, this is the exact same thing a non-human animal would say to somebody who consumes animal products. I knew then and there I had to change what I was doing in my life and how I was eating chocolate. So children in West Africa, again, who are responsible for 70 to 75 percent of the world's cocoa, are majority um, slaves. Um, what happens is how they get there. So you have children getting there from a variety of ways. You have very, very poor countries nearby, like Burkina Faso and Mali, where these children are, you know, their parents think that they're going to go and they're going to get work, and they're going to make money, and they're going to be able to bring back that money to their family. What the families don't know is they may never see their child again. Another way they get there is sometimes they're sold into it from a family member who is trying to make money. But unfortunately, the third way in which these children get there is they're actually kidnapped from the marketplaces and towns, and they are brought to the cacao industry. These children work with machetes, 
um, very long machetes. Some children is seven years old carrying these heavy machetes. Uh, it's been documented where you can see scars on the arms and the legs of the children. And they are locked in at night. If they try to escape, they are beaten or they're killed. If they don't carry the cacao pods fast enough, they're beaten. All of this for chocolate. All of this for our great need for chocolate. So what Food Empowerment Project did is we decided to create a list of chocolate that we felt comfortable recommending. Again, every company on our list makes at least vegan chocolates. Again, as a vegan organization, we're really only going to promote those companies that make vegan chocolates. Um, but these companies are ones that do not source from West Africa. There's only a few exceptions on our list because they're cooperatives. Unfortunately, there are problems with fair trade, so it's not as easy as picking up a chocolate bar and seeing the fair trade logo. And unfortunately, candy bars, as you know, like with animal products, aren't going to say, you know, the cow was strung up by his leg and his throat was slit. These chocolate bars that you buy are not going to say where it's sourced from more than not. So we created this list to help people. We also created a list of companies that we don't recommend and why we don't recommend them. So at the top of that list is a company called Cliff Bar. Thank you. Um, a lot of the, and the sad part is that a lot of the companies that didn't respond to us are actually vegan companies. Even though we're a vegan organization and we're trying to work and acknowledge the oppression and exploitation that's happening to other beings, vegan companies don't seem very willing to talk to us about this issue. We actually have a campaign right now against Cliff Bar. If you see at the top, Cliff Bar is sold in many countries, including Austria and Germany. We're asking people, Cliff Bar will not tell us where they source their chocolate from. As consumers, we have a right to know. We have a right to demand transparency. We're talking about slavery here, downright slavery taking place. We have a right to know. We ask everybody to please sign our petition online. Please spread the word. Companies like this are trying to get outside of the United States and sell, again, like Steve was talking about earlier, they want to, their whole thing is about production, capitalism, profit. We got to stop them. We have to let them know this is unacceptable. We have two apps, um, and I'm not very good with apps since I don't have an iPhone, but one is for an iPhone and one is for an Android. And you can go on there and you can use that list to help you figure out which chocolates we do and don't recommend. And what we ask you to do is that we're, um, there's a film called The Dark Side of Chocolate, and The Shady Side of Chocolate is the companion to that. And the filmmaker is asking us to please get more European companies on our list. So if there's any companies, it, it's somewhat mixed. I've spoken in New Zealand, so we have some New Zealand companies on there. But if there's a chocolate company that you like that's not on our list and you want us to look into where they source their chocolate from, just email us. I'll say in English. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we'll look into the company for you, and we'll let you know, and then we'll add it to our list. But we're trying to populate this list as much as we can so that um, we know, uh, you know, vegans more than not do want to make sure we're not supporting any type of exploitation and suffering. So this is going to hint a little bit on one of the areas that Steve talked about as well, and that's what's happening in these other countries. We encourage people to boycott Coca-Cola, to boycott a lot of these corporations um, for a lot of reasons, but one of which is the fact that they are privatizing water in countries. Um, they're trying to own water supplies. So you have in Chiapas, Mexico, Coca-Cola trying to privatize water. In India, the same problem. When we're talking about these these issues of, of wars and, and rebellions that are taking place, almost often than not, they're taking place because corporations are buying the water. Water, which is to be a natural resource for all of us, which should be free, these corporations are buying it. And this isn't just happening in, in developing countries. In the United States, there's a lot of water rivers that are owned by Nestle. Right now, you have a fight in Canada going on with the indigenous people there because they're trying to buy a, a water there. Actually, they've been taking the water. I don't know why I'm saying they're buying it. They've been taking the water supply from the First Nation people. And this is what they need to survive on. But corporations are buying this water up. These corporations are responsible for union busting in places like Colombia, where we're talking about they're killing the union organizers. So Coca-Cola, to some, may be vegan, but it sure is not as cruelty-free. 
One of the other areas that we work on is access to healthy foods in communities of color and low-income communities, where um, I, I explained people of color, but we know that this phenomenon, I've spoken in a number of other countries to find out that this problem of lack of access to healthy foods takes place in Canada, again, with the First Nations people. It happens in New Zealand with the, the Māori, the, the, the indigenous people of New Zealand, where the people don't have access to healthy foods. So a lot of people term this, which you may, may or may not have heard, called food deserts, um, where you're talking about a certain area of a city where certain portions of the population don't have access to fresh fruits and veggies, and what they have access to instead are liquor stores and fast food restaurants. So what happens in the United States a lot of times is that you'll see a lot of reporting on blacks or Latinos um, having high rates of diabetes or obesity or heart disease, and again, they blame the victim. They say those people don't want to eat well without acknowledging that it's a lack of access to healthy foods. And the lack of access is spurred by discrimination and racism that takes place. So, and this is a concern for our organization because what happens in the United States a lot is that people say things like, oh, it's easy to be vegan, everybody can be vegan. Without actually understanding there's a privilege and a place that being vegan comes from for many of us. But it's not the same everywhere. It's not that easy. If you do not, if you have to take two buses to get to a grocery store in order to buy fresh tomatoes, and you work two to three jobs to keep the roof over your and your family's head, it's not that easy to be vegan. So our work is actually geared towards trying to look and see what the problem is in these communities in terms of access and how we can help. So we went and we surveyed um, where we were based at the time in Santa Clara County, which many of you may be familiar with. It's where Google and Apple are based. It's called the Silicon Valley, a very wealthy area, an area that used to be strewn with um, canneries because trees everywhere were growing produce on them. So we decided to survey this area and find out what, what the access was like there when you have such wealth going on. Do you have a problem with access to healthy foods? Now, Food Empowerment Project is an all-volunteer organization. We have no paid staff, and um, we do everything as much as we can on our own time. And, but where I lived, I lived where there were two liquor stores across the street, and I had to drive 15 minutes to another town in order to get fresh produce. So I knew there was somewhat of a problem. And this is the information of, of what we got. We surveyed over 200 locations on access to fresh fruits, veggies, um, and frozen and canned as well. And we found that the higher income areas had 14 times more access to frozen veggies than the lower income areas did. You had 50% more liquor stores in the lower income areas than you did the higher income areas. So being vegan it wouldn't necessarily be that easy for a lot of these people who don't even have a car. Being an ethically based vegan organization as well, we also surveyed on their access to meat and dairy alternatives. Again, if you look surely at the health aspect of it, we know that eating a diet higher in fruits and veggies and not consuming animal products is better for your health. We also looked at dairy alternatives, and one of the main reasons other than the health um, we looked at all of this for the ethical reasons, and we made it very clear to everywhere, every policymaker that we spoke to that we are an ethically based organization. But one of the things about the dairy issue is that the majority of people of color are lactose intolerant. So you have anywhere between 50 to 85 percent of Latinos and, and blacks being lactose intolerant, and an even higher ratio of Asian Americans. Um, who are lactose intolerant, and yet these are our communities where we don't have access to these alternatives. This is something that, that we term like food apartheid, where you have a portion of the population that deliberately is being denied food that's healthier to them. In fact, what you're offering them is food that makes them sick, because dairy makes people who are lactose intolerant sick. We followed up with this, and what we found in, you know, like all areas, what you find out is that well-meaning NGOs and policymakers have their own idea of what the solution is to certain problems. 
And it doesn't always involve the communities who are most impacted. So our work focuses on actually talking to these communities and finding out what would help them get better access to healthy food. What could we do? You know, our premise is, is that healthy eating and healthy food should be, a, should be a right, but unfortunately in the United States, eating healthy is a privilege, and it shouldn't be that way. And what we found, ironically, we did all the focus groups, they were all done in Spanish. Um, what we found, at least in two of these focus groups, that there were children, the, the parents had children who were actually vegans. And it was an issue for them to figure out how to, um, to feed them. We're going to be coming out with the results of, of that work that we did in hopefully the next few months. Again, being all volunteer, things seem to take a long time. So again, this is when I talk about this issue not just being um, the United States. This is the exact same information. You could replace the Mori people in, in New Zealand with blacks or Latinos in the United States. And again, I apologize that as I was looking through, looking for information, this is about food deserts in England, I was like, wow, I guess this is only taking place in, you know, the U.S. and, you know, New Zealand. And then I realized when I was doing my search, every search I was doing was in English. So maybe if you search for these issues in, your, in French or German, you might actually find that this issue is not just in, in the English-speaking places. Um, our hope and our goal with all of this work is that we want people off the system, the word empowerment is in our name because we want people, people feel empowered when they grow their own food and they're self-sufficient. And we know as being vegans that we can do that on our diet if we have access to the land, if we have access to the ability to do these things. But that's what we're wanting. We want people to be able to um, be self-sufficient so they don't feel disempowered by a system. And unfortunately, a system, at least in the United States, that works to weaken us, that works to make us feel bad about our culture or our skin color and makes us feel less than who we are. So in terms of what, this is what we talk to people about what they can do. Again, going vegan is, a, is in some ways, is one of the easier things that people can do if they have access to that fresh produce. We encourage people to lend their voices to the farm workers in the ways, and hopefully some of you have heard about the great work of the Immokalee workers um, in Florida and the United States who are making great strides for farm workers. But we encourage people to find out what's happening. Where is your food coming from? How are the workers treated? Is there things that you can do to make sure that your food is ethically sourced? Joining campaigns, corporate campaigns for farm workers, any type of legislation going on. Buy organic when you can. Now, as all of you in this room know, when you talk about organic when it comes to farmed animal products or animal products in general, um, just because it's organic doesn't mean the animals are treated any better, right? I mean, we know that. Same thing with farm workers. Just because it's organic does not mean the farm workers are treated better, at least in the United States. There are no regulations on that. It just means one less bad thing is happening to the animal. I mean, to the, <laughs> I'm so used to talking about animals. Uh, one less bad thing is happening to the farm worker, that they're not being doused with agricultural chemicals that are endocrine disruptors and carcinogenic. Ethical chocolate. I mean, again, I mean, I can't tell you how hard it is to see when animal groups say things like cruelty-free chocolate or compassionate chocolate when it's slathered in slavery from West Africa. And unfortunately, again, many of these vegan companies unfortunately use chocolate that comes from West Africa. You will find some of the companies on our list under we do not recommend and we explain why because they're working on it. They're still coming from West Africa. If you really care about this issue and you really care to put your ethics where your mouth is when it comes to this, only buy chocolate that's on our recommended list or one that you know is not sourced from the worst forms of child labor, which is primarily West Africa. Boycott companies such as Coca-Cola. Speak out against in food injustices. And then you can sign up to our e-alerts. Um, we're trying again with our chocolate list. We do want to make it more international. Black slide, my pontification again. Um, basically, I think that, you know, I've been doing animal rights activism since I was in high school. And one of the things that I've learned over this time is how many opportunities we've lost in working with other social justice movements. When I was um, working, we worked in Texas against uh, an Air Force base that was using animals for experiments. 
What I didn't know at the time, which I learned decades later, was that in that same community, at that exact same time, were community members fighting that same Air Force base because their family members were dying from the chemicals, um, chemicals being used at that Air Force base. If we could have joined together, if we could have linked our voices together, we could have been a lot stronger. I think many of you are familiar with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I don't know how wide his scope is. But for those of you who do know who he is, um, his, he's best known in the United States for his fight for civil rights. But what a lot of people don't understand is that he wasn't as dangerous to the powers that be at that time. They dealt with him. He was working within the system. When he started talking about the poor people's movement, when he started talking about the janitors, when he started talking against the war, he got dangerous to them. That's when he was assassinated. That's when he became dangerous, and that's what we need to be more aware of when we do our work. We need to join in with these other issues. If we're going to use a slogan like this, how are we living up to this, and what are the means in which we're doing that? If we're talking to people about veganism and how the animals are treated, and we have one of these buttons on, and you're sipping Coca-Cola, or you're eating a candy bar that clearly comes from slavery, how is that really living up to this? Now, I'm not asking animal rights groups or animal rights activists, give up your activism for the animals and start working on human rights issues. Food Empowerment Project has found a way to, so we can do it all if we want to. But if you are gonna talk about this stuff, then at least be consistent in your own choices. Drinking bottled water? Water privatization, not only to mention the plastic, that is never going to go away. That we can figure out ways in the, our own lives and our own activism and how we talk about these issues to bring others together. And that's the key. We need to be able to bond with these other social justice movements. I mean, Food Empowerment Project, we're a progressive group. I was thrilled that this conference made a statement against racist and fascists from coming here. Food Empowerment Project gets questioned on the fact if we offend Republicans. Well, our group isn't for Republicans. You know, they're not going to like what we have to say because we're talking about fighting injustice in a capitalist system. There are other mainstream groups that will absolutely talk about animal rights in a way that will appeal to Republicans and conservatives, and that's great, but it's not our group. And I'm okay with that. I mean, I think at first I was worried. Um, that's why we're all volunteer, probably. But, you know, these are the things that we have to do, that we have to be able to bridge. And these are progressive people who work on these issues already inherently have knowledge and are suspicious of a system that exploits others, that oppresses others. So the best thing we can do is show consistency and align ourselves with them as much as possible. Thanks.